All right. Uh, so I would like to introduce our next tutorial um, led by Marie Lau from UC Riverside, uh, giving a really useful, I think, uh, tutorial on quasar absorption line fitting, particularly for those of us who are uh, theorists or computational people, or even observers who operate in different realms of the electromagnetic spectrum where there wouldn't necessarily be um, uh, clean absorption line features to fit. So, uh, I, and I encourage people to, rather than asking questions in the Zoom chat, doing so in the Halo 21 tutorials chat um, so that it's preserved a bit longer than, than, than the, the 40 minutes left in our Zoom. Okay, take it away, Marie, thanks. Is there a tool? i Marie. This tutorial was motivated by participants' requests in the Slack channel, Halo 21 Analysis Coax. Thank you for joining. I'll begin with a brief review of the voice profile. If you want a longer review, a good reference would be Professor Mark Krumholz's graduate course material. Then I'll talk about how to fit Quasar Continuum with Line Tools. It's a Python-based software written by Professor X. Prochaska and Professor Nicholas Tejos. I'll illustrate with an example. And then I'll talk about fitting absorption lines with Alice. It's a Python-based software written by Dr. Ryan Cook. Alice is his wife. I'll again illustrate with an example. Originally, I thought about making a Jupyter notebook about this, but I didn't write these softwares myself, so it's better to, to just illustrate what I did, which you may have to customize for your machine. At last, I'll hand over to Professor Burchett to demonstrate his beeper and Professor Bordeloy to demonstrate his RBV fit. Here is some review on the voice profile. Consider observing a bright continuum source, such as a quasar. The source produces a flux f nu of zero. The light from this source passes through a cloud of foreground gas. The flux that we observe is f nu of zero times exponential minus tau nu. This tau nu is non-negligible only over a narrow range in frequency. Outside this range, we can directly measure f nu of zero. By interpolating from one side of a line to the other, we can estimate f nu of zero in the frequency range where a line is absorbed. Radiative transfer calculations give the optical depth tau nu equals some constants times the oscillator strength of a given transition times the column density of the species through the cloud times the line profile function. The line profile function Phi nu is a voice profile. A voice profile is a complicated function that has a Gaussian core and Lorentzian damping wings. If we focus on the core, we can approximate phi nu by a pure Gaussian. In the Gaussian form, the B parameter is the Doppler broadening parameter and is equal to square root two times the velocity dispersion. So by modeling the absorption line profile, we can derive this B value, the column density, and the line center's observed frequency. As the optical depth increases, all the photons near the line center are absorbed. The line center is said to be saturated. And as the optical depth continues to increase, the saturation region extends beyond the Doppler core of the line, and the damping wings dominate. For H1 Lyman alpha, the damping regime happens at an optical depth of 10 to the 5, and that corresponds to a column density of a few times 10 to the 19 per cm squared. What is called interpolating over absorption lines in the coarse material is what observers call fitting a quasar continuum. I will describe the line tools algorithm and the audience may correct me. The spectrum is split into an arbitrary number of wavelength intervals about 10 rest angstroms wide. The flux median is calculated in each wavelength interval. The central wavelength and the median flux of these intervals define a set of points and a cubic spline is fitted through the points. 
pixels that fall more than 1.5 standard deviations below the spline are masked as outliers. This process is iterated until no further pixels are removed as outliers. The fit is visually inspected, and in regions where the fit appears poor, the user can manually tweak it. The quasar spectrum can then be normalized by this unabsorbed continuum. Here's a longer description of the Line 2's algorithm. I wrote this blurb for a co-authored paper. I put it here for your reference in case you need to write a paper using Line tools, and I'm not going over this. But the slides will be uh, preserved after the fact, so people can, can read this at their yeah. leisure. Yeah. Yes. The example I use is a quasar at redshift 0.9. I use its cost far UV spectrum from the CASPA survey. The data is stored in a FITS file, which I name FUV underscore CASPA.FITS. And the data includes the flux array, the error array, and the wavelength array. The data is loaded into what's called an X Spectrum 1D object in line tools. I named this X Spectrum 1D object FUV spec. In this Jupyter notebook screenshot, the first cell and the second cell are just loading the data. The third cell is where the continuum fitting method is called, and I give a guess to the redshift. As I call the fit continuum method, a GUI window pops up. It shows the data and the automatic fit. The gray curve is the flux array of the data versus the wavelength array. The red curve is the continuum. The red circles are the spline knots. The automatic fit is already quite good, except for the geochronal emissions. In my Jupyter notebook, a menu of all the interactive options are printed, and I just list a few important options here. They are interactively zoom in and out, set plot limits, uh, add a new uh, panda plot window left and right, add a new spline knot, delete the nearest knot, and move the nearest knot. I can zoom into different spectral regions and inspect. If the fit is poor somewhere, I can move a knot by pu putting my cursor at where I want the knot to be. When I'm satisfied with the fit, I type Q to quit. That will save the continuum in the same X Spectrum 1D object that holds the data. So the continuum is saved into the FUV spec object. I can call the write method to write the contents back to the file from which data is loaded. I verify that this FITS file has a new extension added, and the extension is named continuum. At this point, I'd like to ask, are there any urgent questions? Um, I can't see the, the chat window, so I assume no. Um, yeah, okay. No questions, I think. Okay. Um, so the continuum, um, so we just covered how to fit a quasar continuum. This continuum is used to divide the flux spectrum. We can then fit absorption lines. In the Slack channel, Halo 21 analysis codes, a few Python packages have been mentioned. There are Alice, Viper, and RBV fit. I'm going to illustrate Alice. The example to use is though the cost far UV spectrum of the same quasar. I'm going to fit a few of these associated absorption lines. The word associated means the absorption happens within several thousand kilometers per second of the quasar's redshift, and they're often physically associated with the quasar. I selected three lines, 04608, 04787, and 05629. As this quasar is part of the CASPA survey, the associated absorption have already been modeled by Professor Todd Tripp using VPER. I'm going to reproduce the results using Alice. And I note that the Alice package depends on line tools for reading the cost line spread functions. The input to be fed into the software is named something.mod. 
is an ASCII file. In the file, you specify the data and an initial guess for the model. The first line says run atomic, atomic underscore mori dot XML. Atomic underscore mori dot XML is the file that contains the atomic data to be read by Alice. The default atomic data table that comes with Alice is named atomic dot XML. And I added atomic data of several more transitions. Next few lines are some settings for running the fitting process and displaying the results. And the next block of lines are for specifying my data. Inside the data read block, I give the path to my data. I only have one data file and it's named fuv underscore norm ASCII. The contents of this fuv underscore norm ASCII comes from that fits file that I saved from the work with line tools. Alice can only read the spectrum in ASCII format and the spectrum has to be normalized. I also need to specify the wavelength ranges for fitting. I visually inspected the spectrum and I see absorption of 04608 in the range 1166.5 angstroms to 1169.5 angstroms. I see absorption of 04787 in another wavelength range. And I see absorption of 05629 in another wavelength range. I also specify the spectral resolutions, which for calls are given by some predefined line spread functions, LSF. The next block of lines in this something.mod file is for specifying an initial guess of the model. Inside the model read block, I specify some parameters of the voice profile that should be fixed or limited. Then I specify an emission model, which for a normalized spectrum is just a constant value of 1.0. Then I specify an absorption model. All the line profile functions are void. For each ionic absorption component, I give a guess to its column density, its redshift, and the Doppler B value. For example, let's look at the first line below the line that says absorption. It says the ion is O4 with a mass number of 16. The gas to the column density in log scale is 14.3. The gas to the redshift is 0 0.9192. And the gas to its B value is 5 kilometers per second. There are many numerical values in this model read block. If I want to specify that a certain numerical value should be fixed in the modeling, I put some uppercase letters after it. For example, the emission should be a constant of 1.0, so I put uppercase letters C and S after it. They can be any uppercase letters. You may also notice that I put some lowercase letters after the redshift gases and the Doppler B gases. If I wanted to tie a certain O4 component to a certain O5 component, I would have put the same lowercase letters after their guesses. In this example, the components of O4 and O5 do not trace each other, so I'm not tying them. After I finish writing this something.mod file, in the terminal prompt, I run this command, run underscore Alice something.mod. As I run Alice, the software searches for the local minimum of the total chi-squared between the model and the data. The results of each iteration are printed to the terminal. The final fitting results are printed to a file named something.mod.out. The fitted model is printed in the same format as the initial guess model, but with numerical values updated. Here I show the output model copied from something.mod.out. The errors of the fit model come after the model itself. The software also outputs a figure showing the fits to the data. Next, um, I can compare my fitting results to the truth set. For most components, the two sets of results are very similar. The only exception is O5 component 4. This is a weak component and is heavily blended with neighboring components, so there is some degeneracy. Overall, I'll call the results quite good. 
Finally, some tips on using Alice. The default atomic data table does not have some of the line signs analyzed, so I augmented the atomic data table. Another tip is about the scenario where the absorber only partially covers the emitting source. There is no straightforward way to handle this. Partial coverage is not implemented in the master branch of the Alice repo on GitHub. To customize your way of handling partial coverage, you can clone the cover factor branch and add it to the lfunk underscore voice of high file. And this is the end of my tutorial. Thank you. Great, thank you, Marie. Um, and so related to all of this, uh, that was a that was a, a great demonstration and 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 honestly really good for for teaching this material to in 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 courses graduate level courses and such. But to supplement this, we are going to have uh, Joe Burchett and Rongmon Bordloy give um, a couple slides describing different programs. So. Uh, Joe, do you want to, to take over next? Yes. So <clears throat> just grab the uh, desktop here. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I uh, along with um, uh, the excellent tool that that uh, Marie just demonstrated, um, she asked me to and and and, and it come up in the um, in the appropriate Slack channel um, to discuss uh, this piece of software that uh, I started back in grad school. Um, and, uh, you, you know, it's it's one of these classic, uh, I know I shouldn't reinvent the wheel, but, um, you know, none of the wheels I had at my disposal uh, did I feel really uh, uh, was um, meet all of the kind of needs that, that I needed in terms of, um, of, of analyzing my data in, in an expedited way. So, so I uh, came up with what I call the Veeper. Uh, so this is a VoIP profile fitting code, uh, formerly called JobyVP. Uh, the GitHub um, repository is here. Um, and kind of what motivated uh, me to, to write this, this software was that I needed to fit uh, lots of lines over you know, multiple redshifts, and um, do so simultaneously um, over a broad range of wavelengths. So, you know, from the, the bluish part of the spectrum to, uh, to the red end. Um, and to do so uh, in an efficient manner to get the, the, the line fit parameters, uh, my, the tool I predominantly used at the time uh, was one I think that was uh, originally, originally written by, uh, by Dan Welty and passed down through uh, Joe Meiring. Um, and so I, was, I, I went ahead and, and plugged it into um, the Pi IGM package, which includes a, a ton of stuff. Um, and one of the, the really helpful things there is a line identification software in, in an accompanying workflow that was developed by Nicholas Tejos. Um, we've also added the ability to run fits in, in batch mode, um, so to speak. And so this is, this is really nice dovetailing with, um, with IGM guesses because you have a workflow where you can identify all the lines in the spectrum, extract uh, a, a line list, and then run the fits of all of the lines that you've identified um, sort of in a, in a non-interactive way. Um, but uh, I wanted to also have a, a means of, of interactively fitting, and so I developed a, a GUI. Um, and then uh, the software plugs into line tools, which uh, is a, a, a storehouse for line spread functions, atomic data, um, all kinds of stuff, um, a, a number of analysis, screen analysis tools uh, in and of its own. So a lot of people have contributed that it's no longer Joe BVP because um, it's, it's now uh, the product of, of several people's efforts, some of whom I list here. But um, just moving to thinking about the, <clears throat> uh, the IO for the software, so it's, it's really driven by line lists that include um, just some, some, some basic uh, attributes, the, the name of the spectrum file that you're fitting, uh, rest frame wavelength of whatever line, its redshift, and then some starting values for column density, uh, B value, velocity centroid, and then using uh, some flags for all of those parameters, you can tie 
uh, uh, certain parameters to one another, such as for two transitions of the same species, lemma alpha and lemma beta here, um, or just allow them to vary freely. Okay, so um, see this in action. Um, so I have uh, a spectrum that uh, to which I've fitted a continuum using the line tools uh, function that, that Marie just, just nicely demonstrated. Um, and so I will load in my continuum fitted spectrum along with this uh, line list. And this is the graphical user interface. There are, uh, what is this, eight lines that uh, are in the line list, a couple of Milky Way silicon four lines, and a couple of components, three components of H1 uh, detected in both Lyman alpha and Lyman beta. And so the key here uh, uh, is that all these lines have to be fitted at the same time. Why? Uh, because uh, the, the, the silicon four lines are blended with uh, the H1 lines. Uh, and we also have the, the Lyman beta um, lines uh, here that are, that are a little weaker. So I've loaded in my parameter file. And uh, with that, I can go ahead and run the fit. And so the resulting fit is seen down here. You can see we nicely account for the blended component structure. Um, the two components, three components of H1 and the, uh, the blended Milky Way lines, uh, just column density, B value. The errors on all of these quantities um, appear in, the, uh, uh, in this window. So you can then add in a new, you can bring in a new um, line list. So I have several that I've created here. Um, let's go ahead and go to a different set of lines. And we get a nice quick fit for two components of H1 in both Lyman alpha and Lyman beta. This also has a batch fit mode, as I mentioned. So um, over here, I've, I've created a, I have two line lists, uh, group three and group four. Um, so I've just dumped those into a little text file and I can run uh, the so-called batch fit mode where It'll just go through each of those line lists, fit the lines, um, and at the end, uh, it will extract, uh, produce a nice um, file for your inspection. Here, this is the compiled uh, fit inspection file for um, all of the lines that are identified in the spectrum. So I just, um, we, we went through IGM guesses, identified all the lines, extracted the line list, and then ran the fit in batch mode, uh, non-interactively, so you can see it does a pretty good job. Um, and then you can go back and, and tweak any parameters as necessary um, to, get, uh, to get a better fit if it, uh, if it uh, um, mangles some kind of B value or something, uh, you don't get such a great fit. So that's the tool, uh, it's available on GitHub, and feel free to contact me if you uh, want any help setting it up. Terrific. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, uh, we'll have to write down links for all the various tools for doing this from both Marie as well as Joe. And and now Rongmon's demonstration. Rongmon, um, would you like to, to share screen and demonstrate yet another uh, method for doing all this, this business? Sure. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so again, uh, I guess it's for every grad student, it's kind of a rite of passage to write their own point profile fitter. That's how I got started. I wrote my own thing. And I'm the only astronomer in, in this field who I know used to use MATLAB. So I had to write everything from scratch because nobody else was using it. So anyhow, it evolved to a Python-based uh, software right now. And my goal here was to really use a simplified, user-friendly MCMC void profile fitter. And the heart of the code is really um, a class which arbitrarily allows you to generate a bunch of void profiles for any redshift. Um, the code is available in GitHub. Um, it is pretty much uh, using other code, obviously. For example, to fit, uh, what, uh, to do an MCMC fit, I use the MC uh, code package, as well as to do corner plots, I use the corner package, et cetera, which are standard. 
I use line tools just to grab, uh, let's say, a fix file or to grab the cost LSF because I was too lazy to write my own code for that. Um, otherwise, uh, one thing I wanted to point out, the beautiful example that Marie and Jill showed are with amazing data. Those are the kind of spectra I would dream of having. But reality is not that good. Uh, Hubble doesn't always give, HSC tag doesn't always give you so much time. So you might end up with a spectrum which looks like this. Um, you know, so it's a little bit much noisier than the beautiful spectrum that uh, they were showing. We can always zoom in. Um, and you can see that signal noise is not that great. However, there's a lot of absorption lag. And when you fit such noisy data with a standard least square fitting tech routine, you might be stuck in a local minimum. That was, and plus there will be other uh, like contaminations there. That's why I wanted to try to fit it using a Bayesian method. And so here, what in this demo, I'm showing you an actual example of a cross spectrum, which is pretty noisy. And what I'll try to show you is fit a series of Lyman alpha, Lyman beta, and Lyman gamma lines here simultaneously. Um, this uh, basically, the, there are two uh, IPython notebook files in the repository, which has these examples. So you should be able to, in principle, run it without any issues, as long as you have the dependencies installed. Um, so I wanted to show you a little bit of pre-processing. Um, simply, I am taking the spectra and using a NumPy where statement, just slicing the relevant pieces of the spectra where I want to perform the fit. That's it. So I am choosing to fit at a redshift of redshift 0.46, where there happens to be an absorber. And I want to fit three lines, so I'm slicing the relevant wavelength array. You can slice in nice however you want. This is really, you can substitute this part with your own personal uh, input file, where you have a very well-processed file. This is kind of the important part here. Um, I have a simple GUI where which allows you to kind of guess what are your input parameters. Um, for example, I want to fit a, a H1 column density profile to this absorb absorption trough. So I can simply say that what is the redshift, what are the relevant redshifts that I'm interested in, and call this GUI. And then I can, let's say, I guess there is an absorber here. So a, a cloud here. I guess there is another cloud here. I guess there is another cloud here. So it allows you to interactively identify where the clumps are. And then I can also guess uh, for this clump here, what is the Doppler B parameter guess? Let's say I'm saying 80 kilometers per second. Why not? Uh, for the second clump, I want to say it's 30. The third clump, I want to say it's again 30, because why not? Then some bookkeeping is done so that it can be fed in. And this is really the heart of the program. This will effectively generate any arbitrary void profile you want for any set of redshift. If you have, uh, let's say, interloping absorbers, you can also add here. If you have some nuisance parameters, you can add it here. Um, I, in this case, I have chosen to have a Gaussian full width half max uh, Gaussian as a convolution parameter, which is uh, 6.5 pixels. You can also change it. It's just with HST cost setting to grab the corresponding line spread function. Um, so if I just plot here, it'll, oops, um, I did not execute this. Um, if I just plot here, you'll see an ugly plot where I'm showing the three little slices of spectrum that I'm trying to fit here. Um, and it, uh, these are the initial guesses that I'm using. And the second part, again, you can substitute this part with your favorite fitter. But all I'm doing is I'm taking my model and running it to fit in an MCMC manner. Um, I'm not going to run it because it takes like 30 seconds, but ignore the errors. There are always those coming up. It, it does the fit, and you're pretty much done. Then I can show all the fitted parameter in a nice corner plot. And it's kind of important to show that I have fitted a rather noisy spectrum. And I have three column density estimates. And you can sort of see you have multimodal posterior probability distribution for your best case velocity centroid, et cetera. Um, so that's it. Your fitting is done. And if I go ahead and plot, uh, again, the code does it for you. All I have to do is take your posterior distributions, plot the output, and you can immediately see, you know, three parameters are fitted with a 
best fit log n, which are asymmetric error bars, B parameter asymmetric error bar, and also the velocity centroids. Multiple iterations are being shown here, which shows, you know, what is your uncertainty in fitting, let's say, a noisy parameter like this. So I believe a MCMC method captures your uncertainties a bit more accurately, especially if you have blending and you have to fit, let's say, a, a, another object at a different redshift, etc. And then you can go have your output file name, execute this cell, and it'll save it in a, Py uh, in a Python dictionary format, but you can change it to whatever you want. So this is the, the core of the program. Um, there is also another example given where instead of doing an interactive fit, I'm just by hand defining what are the uh, initial guesses that I'm using to fit the profile. Everything else remains the same. Um, so essentially this program was inspired and I had to write it in Jupyter Notebook because most of my students um, prefer to work in Jupyter Notebook and they're not very well versed in terminals. Um, but yeah, it's pretty user friendly. And if you decide to use it, please let me know. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, so now everyone has tools for, for being able to do uh, absorption line fitting in a variety of different ways. Yeah, um, I will kind of get all these relevant links and put them in the tutorials um, channel so for for future use but of course this is the the whole tutorial is being recorded so we'll have that uh, indefinitely well uh, excellent work thank you very much Marie Joe and Rongmon that those were really eye-opening in terms of this new this this methodology um, I suppose we don't have to move to a breakout room uh, since this is the final one. So if there are any questions for any three of our, uh, our speakers on that last tutorial, I encourage people to ask them now if they wish. Um, yeah, so and... I'm a little bit interested in it. Perhaps it's a, a too much of a theoretical question, but uh, the, uh, um, the Lorentzian profile is derived from a completely classical uh, model of a damned harmonic a damped harmonic oscillator with a charge on it driven by uh, an E-field. And so in Drain's book, he talks about like the obvious point that it, uh, that the profile should be in principle be the, uh, derived from the Cromer's Heisenberg formula. Do any of you guys that have experience with this kind of fitting have a sense of what kind of uh, errors there are between the Lorentzian file and the Cromer's Heisenberg? A profile? I mean, I presume it's small, but it's... I think in almost all the cases we're talking about that it's super, super small. Like that's not something that's actually dominating the profile. In fact, by and large, the, the Gaussian uh, core is dominating in almost all cases, unless you're dealing with like a DLA or you're measuring, you know, trying to measure like deuterium or something like that, then you might have to worry about that. But um, I would say for like most applications, this isn't something that is... Uh, that's certainly not what's dominating the uncertainty. I think that the point of like, you know, there being uncertainty in the line identifications themselves or how much like blends are occurring, that's not captured by the actual errors. And so you really do have to worry about that, I would say, much, much more. And I guess my final question was like, uh, you only pointed out when, uh, when Peng showed some of his uh, absorption spectra like many, many days ago, some of the asymmetries that were in, or that he showed were not at all like the, uh, I mean, the standard asymmetries that I would think that would be legitimately fitted by a series, by a series of absorption lines. And so I, I guess the question is when you get a line like that, I mean, what is the physics that's causing that asymmetry and how do you deal with that? Or how do you remove that so that you can fit the spectra sensibly? I might not have seen that spectrum you're referring to. Yeah, it would be hard for me to pull that back up again, but in, instead of it being, instead of the line being symmetric, there was this long fall off like this, and then it came up to like what you would, so. But maybe because it, it's a convolution of two different lines, right? 
Yeah. Like, I mean, the, the profile itself is always symmetric, but, you know, a, a total thing that you see in your spectrum can look super asymmetric and you just have to figure out the combination of all these symmetric profiles to make it uh, work out. Yeah, I guess that's what I'm questioning. I mean, in general, I agree with you, Jess, but uh, but it, 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 at least in so, some of the spectrum, if you've got a, 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 a tail that's going like this, I mean, you would have to have like such a huge number of absorptions to uh, model something like what Penglet was showing that, uh, I, I don't know. I Not wouldn't always. Be oh. Not always. It's usually pretty straightforward. Yeah, the, the example I showed had quite an asymmetric wing on the uh, on the red end due to just the superposition of the Milky Way Silicon 4 and the um, Lyman Alpha of one of the components that was fitting. So, you know, the, the superposition does get you that, um, Yes, yeah, as, as Kirill was just saying, the void profiles are just basis functions, and so, um, so, so adding those two together, and then convolving with the line spread function of the instrument, um, you know, it, it does generally give good fits with with few components. Now we can argue all day about uh, if the number of components we choose uh, is the right number, and this goes back to cloud size and everything else. Um, but yeah, uh, these fits can never be unique, right? But yeah, like right. said, could also the line broadening fun uh, the Doppler B parameter is a combination of both the thermal and peculiar velocity motion that could range from, let's say, 20 kilometer per second to 100 kilometer per second. So you don't need a lot of components to fit the whole profile. Uh, Yuan has been patiently raising her hand. <laughs> I'll bet. Uh, okay, so my thought was actually uh, about whether or not there could be just intrinsic asymmetry in the, in the broadening of the line. And I was really just thinking about one example I saw in, I believe, Josh Wiener's uh, paper about uh, cosmic ray accelerated cold blobs. I'm sure there are other cosmic ray experts here that can correct me. Um, but I, I believe that in, in a case where a cold blob is accelerated by cosmic rays, there's asymmetry uh, within a cold blob of cosmic ray pressure, um, would that result in a, a intrinsic asymmetry of the broadening of the lines? Um, because I understand that with, with thermal broadening, you just automatically get this Gaussian plus whatever. Uh, but if, what if you physically have um, asymmetric broadening? And I can imagine with non-classical turbulence, you can also have a asymmetric broadening. Is that even a consideration or observers just don't even care? <laughs> because we talked about how we distinguish between different models, right? So uh, I how, guess I, I, I just want to see what people think about be? that. Huh? How big of a difference would it be uh, if you have asymmetric velocity profile in one cloud, let's say, is it five kilometer per second, 10? That I don't know. I, I didn't do that work. I don't I don't know if they did mock observations with maybe Trident that might help, right? Um, so that I don't know. So maybe it's all within the, the noise level and it wouldn't even pop up even if you try to fit with some asymmetric profile. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure. It's just something I've been thinking about and I, um, I don't think I've ever actually got that question through some of the people. Because <laughs> like, people just say, oh, yeah, well, you just add another Gaussian component. But that's not what I was asking. <laughs> so I guess one, one question I had that may, may kind of uh, speak a little bit to what Yuan Lee is talking about is, uh, so I've, uh, I have some uh, laboratory experience with getting instrumental profiles. But uh, yeah. Um, do does anybody uh, in this uh, breakout room or le what's left in, uh, today know how uh, what what the standard practice is for getting the line uh, the, the instrumental profile on a telescope? Is that just done at the beginning of every observation, or we can use an arc lamp, I guess. So could you just repeat that? Um, I'm thinking if you want to measure the intrinsic line profile, what people do is to use an arc lamp. Is that what people do? Well, also, Todd, Todd has his hand up, and I think he'll comment on the, the line spread function and how people uh, try to constrain that. Go ahead, Todd. Right. So what happens 
at the beginning of the deployment of a space instrument is that, for example, with costs, observations of some star are obtained and then compared to much higher resolution observations that were obtained, say, with space telescope imaging and spectrograph. And that comparison provides constraints on the line spread function. And then that line spread function is used pretty much subsequently, mm -hmm. exclusively. It's not revisited and maybe, well, sometimes it is, but not very often because it's hard to get Hubble Space Telescope time even for calibrations, unfortunately. Now, if you, you know, you have to sort of drill down and look at the history of the thing. Sometimes there are derivations that are done on the ground before the thing is deployed. With the ground-based instruments, uh -huh. it's usually possible to, to build an instrument that has a really nice line spread function. So it's usually approximated as a Gaussian. But what I'd really like to return to is this business of an asymmetric profile. It's really not fair to say that, it's, that observers don't care. We're quite interested in that. Um, and you can think of what we do as just some way of parameterizing the data. And so you can take the extra Gaussian or whatever that we put in, and then you can look at whether or not that's consistent with your model that requires some intrinsically asymmetric profile. So you might ask, well, why don't you just put in the in intrinsically asymmetric profile in the first place? And the answer is because it's totally unconstrained. You know, you can, you can do that and you don't really have any way of determining typically whether the line is really intrinsically asymmetric or if it's just a juxtaposition of multiple components. And if the juxtaposition of multiple components is entirely reasonable, then there's no, I mean, it, unless you have some you know, theoretical desire to require those asymmetric profiles, there's, there's no real reason to say, okay, it must be intrinsically asymmetric. I mean, if you, if you can explain some reason that this profile has to be intrinsically asymmetric, then that, that's exciting. But typically, you know, there's no real indication that the addition of multiple components is unreasonable. The B values and such, as other folks have said, are, you know, quite plausible. So that's the, that's the problem. And, and, and let me just add, when we find something that is isolated and observed at very high spectral resolution, and let me just point out, in space we can get spectral resolution of 200,000, which is often not available on the ground, the profiles look quite symmetric. I mean, that, that, they, we looked at many, many of these things, thousands actually, and I, I haven't seen any compelling examples where when you have that nice, isolated, well-observed, high signal to noise, high resolution profile, that there's any uh, compelling indication of asymmetry. So, so that's really kind of a quick defense of what observers have done. Uh, I'd love to see it. It would be fascinating. Of course, anything new is very interesting. But so far, I personally haven't seen any evidence that asymmetric profiles are required when you really have a clean and well-isolated case to study. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, I think that's uh, – thank you for chiming in on that. Because, uh, yeah, it's interesting to – to see what observers see and see if, if yeah, if you're, if you're fitting these things as multiple components when there's some intrinsic uh, asymmetry, but it sounds like there isn't. So thank you for, for chiming in on that. Irina Butsky uh, has a comment or, or question, and I think it's related to all of this. I just wanted to circle back to uh, Yuan's point about cosmic ray accelerated clouds. So as far as I know, I don't think there have been any um, synthetic spectra like pointed directly at simulations of this but um, so the physical kind of model you'd have is like a cloud and uh, cosmic ray pressure build up on one side of it and it's accelerating to that other side and so I don't think that cosmic ray pressure would explicitly make it like add to the absorption line signature but it would change the temperature and the density of the gas and it would heat that um, the cloud boundary layer. 
And so you would expect maybe to see multiple, you know, phases of gas at a similar velocity or like, you know, if you can actually resolve the scales of, you know, this is probably a small cloudlet, you know, entrained in a hotter medium. So if you can resolve the, you know, the medium, the body of the cloud and the that line, maybe you might see slight velocity differences, but I'm not sure that this is something we can resolve in current observations, but um, and actually, I don't think 3D simulations have been run of this, so this is certainly something we should consider looking into making predictions for. Yeah, I don't know. Have there been uh, synthetic spectra made for for kind of non-standard physical systems, like including cosmic ray physics in these clouds, for instance? I, I'm not aware of any, but perhaps other people know of it. Yeah, that would be cool. Someone could produce that. It would be very interesting. Uh, this is actually something we're looking into uh, with Jess and um, some collaborators. But these are, uh, this is for a simulation of like a cosmic ray um, dominated halo, not individual cloudlets that are accelerated by cosmic rays and like with cosmic ray streaming, which would be a slightly different application. Um, I'd like to add a comment that um, that's related to asymmetric line profiles. So, of course, when we talk about absorption line spectroscopy, the assumption is that your gases diffuse and dim, and that that's uh, relative to the bright background continuum source. So, um, in response to uh, Dr. Yuan Li's question, what about IFU data? So, um, what happens is that when your gases diffuse and dim, um, you don't actually get the kind of complex and detailed absorption line profiles that um, we've been demonstrating. And you may be spatially integrating the, the line, the emission line to just get a sense of the kinematics. And the other thing is that um, when, when you have IFU data, that means some of your emitting gas is not directly in front of that bright um, background source. And, and so you need to care about radiative transfer modeling. And especially if your line is, say, Lyman alpha is a strong and resonance line. And so you have complicated profiles that look a bit like the p signe profile and, and there are no unique answers to the parameters you put into um, this model. And yeah, so there's a lot of degeneracy. And I put a paper in, in the chat that's Lee et al. 2020. And that's a good example of just showing the amount of degeneracies. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Marie. Are there any other topics that uh, people want to discuss related to the absorption line fitting? No, this seemed to cover, I think, a lot of the questions that Yuan, Lee, and I had at uh, a couple of weeks ago. So uh, thank you very much for organizing this. It's, it's excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Johnny. And anyone else? Oh, uh, I'd make a comment. So I, I have some undergrad students who are beginning to learn the ins and outs of this stuff. And uh, one thing that's challenging for undergrads is we're hearing that everyone's writing their own like fitters. And so like, it's very overwhelming when you try to provide resources for a student because there's literally a thousand different places you can point them to for this void profile stuff. So having like this video and all of the resources that are being made available is going to be super helpful. So that's awesome. Excellent. Yeah. I think that's one of the main points of these tutorials is, is breaking down these boundaries like this. So uh, making it good introduction for people who are new to the field or from outside yeah. the, the subdiscipline. Yeah. Nicola? Yeah, I had a very small, maybe technical question regarding round down tool uh, using EMC, which has some limitations for when the number of parameters become large. It's probably not in, in his example or his cases, but um, the 
primary reason is because the proposal distribution in uh, the EMC is a, a simple Gaussian, which does not um, allow the code to explore the parameter space very quickly. So it's very slow in converging. And uh, I, I presume it would be interesting to, to extend this to other, other code that are more robust and, or, and faster. Oh yeah, it's very easy to do. Uh, I just decided to use MC because it's easy. And when I wrote it, it was very nice. And just, my code is really designed to do small chunks only. Small just chunks. To, only. Just to jump in, that's factually untrue. Um, EMCEE does not use a Gaussian proposal distribution. By default, it does. But what does? But by default, it does. I looked into it, and you can change to to other proposal distribution. Um, it doesn't right? It's a, it, it, you, <clears throat> EMCEE, the affine invariant sampler. Yes, it doesn't use a Gaussian proposal distribution. It uses an affine invariant stretch move, which is not the same thing as a Gaussian proposal distribution. But I think the point still holds that. It's computationally expensive once the profiles become complicated or there are a lot of lines or There's a lot a large of large number of parameters. Yeah, it, yes, it, that that's a, that's a challenge with an MCMC Bayesian approach to this whole business, which is one reason we haven't gone to that wholesale. It's just computationally demanding, and and so the, yeah. It's, it, I think it's clearly a nice, it's the best way to do this, but um, it's hard with computational facilities that many of us have access to. If you have something messy, I mean, with the Cosma data, it's really hard because there are so many different lines from different redshifts and components, and it, it's just, it's hard to do it that way. Yeah, I wrote an algorithm to group lines together in a, in a big line list that have to be fitted together. Um, you know, so, and, it, and it's, it's this kind of rabbit hole thing where, you know, you, um, you have one line that's blended with another and that other line has, you know, three other transitions that all could be blended with other things. And, um, you know, like with a data set like Cosba, like, like Todd's been, um, beating his head against for, for a while. Uh, it's, it's just, I mean, it would be great if, if we could somehow come to a, a means to, uh, to to leverage MCMC, but it's how, how many lines do you have? A typical thing. <clears throat> it, it just depends. Oh, um, right. what's, what's a big number? Hundreds. Hundreds. Okay. Yeah, hundreds and uh, supercomputers. That is huge. Yeah, you don't necessarily need a supercomputer, but you do need. Right. What is true is that EMCEE is not particularly efficient for large problems. And so uh, gradient and Hessian aware samplers are, gradient and Hessian aware proposal distributions are gonna be necessary to do that in a reasonable amount of time, not because of like purely, comp purely numerical computational considerations, but due to sort of algorithmic um, stuff. But so uh, another interesting thing is um, there are a lot of uh, purpose-built there, basically, there's a lot of tools that exist um, that could make this a lot faster. So, for example, something like NumPyro, uh, one of these new ways of doing, uh, of combining um, inference, autograd, um, you know, GPUs, TPUs, et cetera, um, might be the way forward for something with, you know, hundreds of lines where um, it has all sorts of interesting proposal distributions and, like, it's very... There's some very advanced stuff there, and it, it would be a little bit, you know, it would take a bit of porting to get some of these codes to interface with that. Um, Kirill, Nicola, if you guys know a better sampler, can you put it on Slack? I'd love to know. Todd? Oh, you're just applauding. You're not raising your hand. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's great. This is what we need is to find ways to do this faster that I'm very interested. Um, one thing that this is all related to uh, in the Halo 21 Metallicity group over the last few weeks, there's been uh, an effort to do generation of synthetic spectra for very idealized systems where we know the metallicities and then 
getting observers to do uh, absorption line fitting to the output spectra to see if we can pull out and extract the exact same metallicity that's put into the simulation to make sure that there's crosstalk between the observers and the simulators. Um, right now, there have only been a couple of simulator, uh, I'm sorry, a couple of observers who've ta taken up the challenge, but uh, this seems like the right group of people to pitch this to, uh, given the people who are sticking around 15 minutes after the end of our session talking about void profile fitting of absorption features. So um, Zach Hafen and Jane Charlton are going to present on this on Friday for about 15 minutes in the morning uh, before we go into the structured discussion. So I encourage people to check it out uh, because it'll provide a little bit of context for what's going on and, and, and maybe you guys uh, could could get involved with this because it seems like the tools that you presented, both Marie and Joe and, and Rongmon, are are super awesome and uh, and and maybe could make quick work of these simplistic spectra. I th we're about 20 minutes past uh, the hour. Thank you very much to the tutorials, um, Joe, Evan, Marie, Joe again, and Rongmon. Uh, wonderful presentations. I learned a lot, and we're going back. We'll go back over these tutorials to really catch up on the details. But um, very much appreciate this. 